Midwestern winters are notorious for cold north winds, freezing temperatures and snow, lots and lots of snow, so it should have come as no surprise that February was indeed a nasty month. For the first two weeks, no one even saw the sun, just a dull gray winter sky, and it was a leap year to boot. Everyone hoped that March would come like a lamb, with warmth, so no one was happy about the extra February day. Jim stood at his office window, looking out over the winter wonderland that was the city of Chicago. By mid-afternoon, the forecast five centimeters of overnight snowfall had turned into 30, and there seemed to be no end in sight. In Illinois and Indiana, this is called the lake effect. At times, during the morning, it fell so hard and fast that one could barely see the other side of the street, and meteorologists were now forecasting another 30 centimeters by morning. It was about half past one when his secretary entered. Jim, I just received a message from above that we are closing early. I'm leaving now, if you don't mind. Yes, of course, Shirley. Thank you. I'll call Linda and I'll come right out and pick you up. Drive carefully, he added as she started to leave. Absolutely, Jim, and you too. I doubt this will all be cleaned up by tomorrow, so I'll probably see you on Monday she replied as she walked out. He walked over to his sports jacket, which was hanging over the back of his chair, and took his phone out of the side pocket. His wife answered after the second ring. Hey, honey, are you still at work? She asked immediately. Yes, but I'm already about to leave. I wanted to call and see if you wanted me to pick you and the kids up on the way home. I know you don't like driving in the crap like this. You're very nice, honey but you're a little late. They released us from the office more than an hour ago. I took the children and just entered the house. Please drive carefully, the roads are terrible. It will be done, dear. I'll see you as soon as I can. Love you. Bye. Well, knowing that Linda and the kids were home safe and sound took a big weight off his mind. However, he felt bad. It was the 14th of February, Valentine's Day. Every year, he and Linda celebrated this holiday in style. Of course, he always came home with the obligatory card and flowers, followed by a romantic candlelit dinner in a lovely restaurant, a few cheek-to-cheek -cheek dances, culminating in a night of passionate fun while Linda's mom and dad left the kids for the night. Well, a fancy dinner and dancing was out of the question. By evening, no one was going anywhere, but he thought about the florist. By the time he brushed the snow off his car, he decided to give it a try. It was only four or five blocks from his road. Two weeks before, he ordered a beautiful bouquet and absolutely did not want to show up at home empty-handed. Thank God you're still open, he said, greeting the man behind the counter. Yes, I'm going to stay open as long as I can. I imagine many men will leave early and stop here to pick up their orders on the way home. Well, your instincts are correct. That's why I'm here. Jim told him his last name, and a minute later, the florist pulled out a beautiful bouquet of red, yellow, and white roses from the refrigerator. Damn, he's great, Jim told him. What are those purple flowers? Sweet peas, he answered. I added a few to highlight it. Do you like it? This is absolutely amazing, Jim replied. He took the pen and signed the card, inserting his debit card into the machine. It was almost five o'clock when Jim arrived at his house. He lost time on the way to the flower shop, but it was worth it. Jim knew how disappointed his wife would be that she would have to stay home on their special evening, and he hoped the flowers would lift her spirits. If Jim needed a pick-me-up, all he had to do was look into the two angelic faces of his children. Daddy's home, six-year-old Emma cried. Along with their four-year-old little brother Tommy, they jumped off the couch and ran to their proud father as soon as he walked through the door. Jim knelt down and placed the flowers behind him so they wouldn't get crushed before opening his arms for an onslaught of hugs and kisses. He looked up to see his beautiful, smiling wife watching the happy reunion. Finally, I was starting to worry, she said. Well, you were right. The roads are terrible. I'm afraid we won't be going anywhere tonight, darling. Oh, I see she admitted with a pang of sadness. I already called mom and dad to tell them that we won't be dropping off the children with them. I didn't have anything defrosted, so the kids talked me into making homemade pizza for tonight. 
I hope this is okay. Sounds great, he replied. He waited until Linda turned to go back to the kitchen before taking the flowers and hiding them behind his back. Both Emma and Tommy returned to the couch and their TV show. Linda knew he was creeping up behind her, but she smiled silently and turned her back to him, wondering what he was up to. She felt his left arm slide around her waist. Then his lips kissed her neck. Suddenly a beautiful bouquet of mixed roses appeared in front of her, along with the words, Happy Valentine's Day, dear. Oh, Jim, they are great. She turned around, hugged him around the neck, and gave her caring husband a strong, passionate kiss. She grinned as she felt him become aroused. That will have to wait, she said, patting his trousers with the back of her hand. She took the flowers and placed them on the table, then took a card from the envelope. Oh, darling, what have I done to deserve you? She said before giving him another quick kiss. Well, it wasn't the romantic evening they had planned, but seeing the excitement when the kids realized they were going to have a four-day weekend with mom and dad made it a little easier to accept. Emma and Tommy already had plans for a few snowmen, a couple of snow forts, and a long snowball fight, all of which started early the next morning. It was just after nine when Linda and Jim tucked their two excited offspring under the covers for the night. There was still a lot of time left until evening, and Jim was determined to make the best of it. Darling, I'm so sorry that our plans didn't work out. I know the bad weather has been getting on our nerves lately, and I know how much you've been looking forward to tonight. You mean, dude, why did you order all this snow? She grinned. Honey, there will be other evenings when we can go out for dinner. We'll have our own Valentine's Day when the weather improves. Four days off with you and the kids is a great consolation prize, darling, believe me. Besides, she added, I still have a great new evening dress and a beautiful bouquet of roses from it. Who could ask for better than this? Well, he said in his most seductive voice, why don't you go and put on your new evening dress while I open the wine? I'll put on some soft romantic music on the stereo and we'll have our private Valentine's Day date right here. Mmm, she purred enthusiastically. Sounds great, except that you won't see the evening dress until you take me somewhere in the evening. That's wonderful, he replied. You go ahead and put it on, and I'll take it off for you later this evening. She giggled. It's not what I said, but I really like your plan. I'll run and find something suitable. I'll be down in a few minutes, she said, reaching up and kissing him on the lips before running upstairs. Jim thought that if he did everything right, he could start a whole new tradition. He opened a bottle of semi-dry port to let it breathe, popped it into an ice bucket, and placed it on the coffee table along with two wine glasses. Okay, he asked himself. What next? Ah, nothing says romance like a warm, crackling fire in the fireplace. After a few minutes, he succeeded, but there was still something missing. He looked at his expensive selection of vinyl records for an answer. He dimmed the lights, allowing the flickering glow of the fire to create the appropriate atmosphere, poured the wine, then, carefully lowering the needle, filled the air with the voices of love. When Linda entered, everyone was a mazid, Jim by her beauty, and Linda by the romance shown by her husband. They sat silently in front of the fireplace for a while huddled close to each other, sharing memories of their ten years together. When the time came, Jim asked his beloved to dance. As he hugged her, Linda closed her eyes and laid her head on his chest. Darling, this is incredible, thank you. You're welcome, my dear. Happy Valentine's Day, baby. Same to you, darling. I was going to buy you a card on the way home today, but with all the chaos, I didn't have the chance. I'm really sorry. Don't worry about it, honey. I don't need a card to know that I'm your valentine, he replied with a smile. They danced a little more, drank a little more wine, and then quietly walked up the stairs to make sure they didn't wake the kids. By the time Jim quietly closed the bedroom door behind him and turned around, Linda had almost taken off her dress. Well, she asked, standing there in her holiday suit. It was at that moment that Jim realized that he was still dressed. He solved the problem in record time. He was naked by the time she slid under the sheet. 
There were times when Linda liked to be rough and tough, but this was not the case. They had a great night. The next morning set the tone for the rest of the long weekend. Linda woke up to a knock on their bedroom door. Mom, Dad, come on, wake up. Tommy and I were hungry. Linda looked at her watch. It was a little after seven. Oh, she moaned. Okay, honey, you guys go downstairs and watch some cartoons for a few minutes. Dad and I will be down soon. Okay, Mom, but hurry up. Tommy and I want to build a snow fort. We'll go down now, dear. She heard the patter of little feet running down the corridor. Jim barely started to move. Mmm, he purred, feeling his wife's lips press against his. He hugged her and turned her onto her back. He made no attempt to hide his excitement. Linda immediately knew what he was thinking, but had to voice the bad news. Sorry, dear. This will have to wait. The kids are downstairs, and they're hungry. Jim lowered his head, pretending to be upset. Well, we can't go down there without a shower. We both smell like sex. Yes, she grinned, as if they know the smell of sex. Her words made sense. Yeah, okay, you're right. We really need to take a quick shower. I'll wash your back, you wash mine. This way, we'll finish in half the time. The kids were still sitting on the couch, watching TV, when the smiling couple finally came downstairs. The children didn't seem to notice the time delay. They were both engrossed in their cartoons. What do you guys want for breakfast? Linda asked. Pancakes! Two kids shouted in unison. After a nice, hearty breakfast, the four of them went to the backyard to build the best snowman ever, according to Tommy and Emma. Of course, everyone knows that no snowman is safe unless he has a snow fort to protect him. To say it was an all-day affair would be an understatement. By the time Jim and Linda were ready to go to bed, they were too tired to even think about sex. Linda curled up next to her husband when she heard him chuckle. What? she asked. I just happened to think that today is only Friday. We also have Saturday and Sunday. Oh, she moaned. I'm not sure I can handle this, she joked before placing her hand on his chest. Five minutes later, they were both fast asleep. Saturday morning cartoons gave them a short reprieve and delayed adding to yesterday's snow fort, but only for a while. Of course, if you have an award-winning snow fort, you must defend it from invading forces. Hence, the afternoon snowball fight, which ended only after an hour of laughter and Jim raising a white flag in defeat. By Sunday, the streets were pretty well cleared, so they took the kids to a park with a sledding hill. It was the kind of weekend that left lasting memories, as their eldest testified as they put her to bed. Emma reached over and wrapped her arms around both her parents' necks. Thanks for playing with us this weekend. I will never forget this. I love you, Mom and Dad. We love you too, they both told her. Now, said Linda, go to bed. You have to go to school tomorrow. By the time they went to bed, both Jim and Linda were ready to get back to work. They needed to rest. With temperatures too cold to melt anything, the days dragged on with mountains of plowed, dirty snow everywhere, serving as a visual reminder of the ruined holiday, as if anyone needed it. Like most others, Jim, Linda, and the children spent most of their free time indoors. The long, cold winter had left everyone in a bad mood, even Emma and Tommy's carefree relationship was strained. With just a few days left in this dastardly month, Jim and Linda were cozy on the couch enjoying a glass of wine after putting the kids to bed when Linda's phone rang. Jim groaned. And who can call at this time of night? Linda extended her hand and looked at the screen. It's D. She answered with a slight laugh. I'd better answer. It may be important. Dee and her husband, Dave, were part of the close circle of friends they had developed over the years. Counting Jim and Linda, there were five couples in total, but they were closer to Dee and Dave than the others. They were all about the same age and financial status, had many common interests, and had children of varying ages who largely got along with each other. It was always a good time when they all got together, which usually happened several times a year. To avoid disturbing her husband too much, Linda took the phone into the kitchen to talk. 
but Jim could still hear the end of his wife's conversation. Indeed? Oh, D, that's a great idea. Where? Oh, that's great. Yes, I think so. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, that would be great, of course. Yes, that sounds like... Oh, he'll love it. Oh, I'm sure he'll be as excited as I am. Yeah, that was so shitty. Yeah, I'll talk to him right now, but if I don't call and tell you otherwise, count on us. Okay, yes, bye. Linda's feet barely touched the floor as she slid back into the living room. She looked like the cat that'd tee the cannery as she plopped down on her husband's lap and wrapped her arms around his neck. Based on what he heard, Jim decided that he would probably like whatever she had to say, but he had to be a little skeptical to get her to tell his fortune. Okay, so what have you gotten us into? He said with a smile. You will like what I learned, she answered. D has a great idea. Leap year, a night of dinner, dancing, and sex. But won't Dave be mad if I have sex with D? Jim teased, earning a playful punch to his wife's shoulder. The sex part is with me, dumbass. Remember that? She joked back. Leap year is the week starting this Friday. Dave had heard all about the dance club downtown from a couple of colleagues. It's called Downbeat. They have live music on Friday and Saturday evenings. They usually charge $10 per person, but they have an arrangement with the Madison Hotel. If you are a guest at the hotel, you simply show your door key card and the dance club opens the doors. D thinks we can all get a room at the Madison and then have dinner in the restaurant before going to the club. After traveling around the fantastic world for a couple of hours, we will all return to the hotel for a night of decadent pleasures. You don't even have to worry about driving. The dance club is a block away. We can all walk there and back. What about the children? We'll need to see if your parents can host them for the night. Already taken care of, Linda quickly answered. Phil and Jane ask Mrs. Porter to take their children for the night, and they say she doesn't mind taking Emma and Tommy with her. He looked like he was thinking. What is there to think about? Linda wondered. Well? Okay, on one condition, he replied. Which one? You will wear the dress you bought for Valentine's Day. You mean the one you haven't seen yet? She grinned. Exactly. It's nice, she agreed, sealing him with a kiss. The next day, Dee called again to tell Linda that everything was settled. She had confirmation from all five couples, so she booked a party of ten for dinner at 7.30 in the Madison Hotel dining room. It was more difficult for her to reserve such a large table in Downbeat, but in the end she got them to agree. Although they would have to move a couple of tables together to accommodate such a large group, they promised that everything would be ready by nine o'clock. The only thing I didn't do, Dee said, was don't book the rooms. I figured everyone has their own preferences, so I left it up to everyone else. But I wouldn't wait, Linda. When I made the reservation, it occurred to me that we weren't the only ones planning to go out that night and wanting a key card to avoid paying $20 to get into the club. Okay, Linda grinned. I'll ask Jim to order the room as soon as he gets home. We're really looking forward to it, Dee. You are just a genius for coming up with everything. The two good friends talked for a while longer before hanging up. A little later, Jim booked a room at the Madison Hotel with a double bed for February 29th. All they had to do after that was sit back and wait. Having something to look forward to was just what they needed. Each day that passed seemed brighter and better than the previous one. Even the weather was getting warmer. By the time Friday arrived... Jim and Linda looked like a couple of teenagers on their first date. Linda was home and had apparently taken a shower by the time Jim entered. I packed an overnight bag for the children. They're all excited. I'm not quite sure where she heard the term, but Emma calls it a slumber party because Phil and Jane's kids will be there too. I called Mrs. Porter early to thank her and told her we'd deliver a couple of pizzas to her. You don't mind, do you? No, of course not, dear. This is a great idea. She kissed him and noticed that he looked slightly disappointed. Is there something wrong? She asked when their lips parted. No, I just thought we'd start the evening off right and take a shower together. 
he replied with a slight grin. Honey, we have to check into the hotel around seven. You have to get ready. I still need to get myself organized and we have to drop off the kids on the way. If we had taken one of our marathon showers together, we would never have gotten there on time. Besides, we have the whole night ahead of us. He faked a long, disappointed sigh. Oh, good, he moaned before quickly kissing her lips again. Go on, she said. Go take a shower. I'll make a snack for the kids and then go finish getting ready. Emma and Tommy were getting ready for the night and didn't know their father was home until they saw him at the top of the stairs. Hello, Daddy, they both shouted, rushing to hug. They were both excited to spend the night with their friends. He hugged and kissed them again as they heard Linda calling them down. Go on, he told them. Mom made you guys a snack so you don't get hungry, but I need to get ready. Linda had a sandwich and a glass of milk waiting for them on the kitchen table. Mom and Dad need to get dressed, she told them, so you can watch TV when you're done until we're ready to leave. She was in their bedroom, sitting at the dressing table in her underwear, when Jim came out of the shower. She looked in the mirror as he removed the towel from his waist. Are you already excited? Are you taking Viagra or something? No, I just have the sexiest wife in the city. I'm getting out of the shower and you're sitting here in your underwear. What did you expect? He joked. Linda deliberately took her time with her hair and makeup. Jim looked smart in his suit and tie, but hadn't seen the dress yet. She knew what he was waiting for, but she wanted to organize a way out. So she invited him to go downstairs and wait there with the children. She told him she would come down in a few minutes. He was sitting on the sofa between the kids, hugging them, when she appeared. Oh, Mommy, you look great, Emma exclaimed. Linda waited for a comment from her husband, but he was stunned and silent. She always chose a stunning dress for Valentine's Day, but it looked like the best designer in the world made it just for her. The blue color of the dress made her blue eyes shine with an intensity that could penetrate steel. The silky fabric hugged every wonderful curve of her body, but was flared at the bottom so that every flirtatious move she made on the dance floor showed off her long, strong legs. Well? She asked after several seconds of silence. I'm speechless, darling. You look, uh, I don't know the words, darling, beyond stunning, beyond gorgeous. I don't think a word has yet been invented to describe how breathtaking you look. Okay, okay. You don't need to go too far, dear. Honey, I can't go overboard. You look absolutely amazing. He made her blush when Tommy walked in. Yes, Mom, you look really beautiful. Well, thank you all, she said with modest gratitude. They dropped off the children and entered the Madison Hotel lobby a few minutes after seven. Phil and Jane were standing at the reception desk. Jim and Linda came up behind them. Hey, guys, are you ready for a fun night? Linda greeted everyone. The two friends turned to greet each other, but Phil immediately gave Linda a quick glance. God, Linda, you look incredible. Jane playfully elbowed him in the ribs. Now you can put your eyes back where they belong, she said sarcastically. You look really good, Linda. You look good too, Jim. Linda calmly took the compliments and responded to them. Thank you, kind lady. You both look good yourself. Jim supported his wife's comments. Their friends waited until Jim and Linda checked in and then rode the elevator together. I'll see you downstairs at the restaurant in a few minutes, Linda said, as another couple left earlier on the floor. As soon as they entered their room, Jim was ready for romance, but Linda covered his mouth with her hand before he could kiss her. If you smear my makeup, I will kill you before we eat, she threatened with a smile. Jim looked at his watch. But we have 15 minutes, dear. Time for a quickie, he joked. No quick ones for you, my love. I want you all night long. Linda received even more compliments from the entire table when they met the others for dinner. Dee kissed her on both cheeks with air kisses. As usual, when they all got together, the conversation became lively, and there were a lot of jokes, from appetizers to dessert. Everyone was still laughing and having a good time as they walked into the club. They all handed in their coats and were shown to their table. Linda and Jim held hands the entire way. A pretty waitress in a skimpy outfit came over to take their drink orders. Everyone waited to be served before hitting the dance floor. When the drinks arrived, 
Linda took a sip of her strawberry daiquiri, then grabbed Jim's hand. Come on, honey, let's show them how it's done. The rest of the table stood up and followed them to join in the fun. The band wasn't what anyone would call promoted, but they had a great repertoire of songs and mixed them up well. Linda and Jim were among the last to return to their table to rest. Linda was a better dancer than Jim, but he could still show off. Linda had never been shy about him as her partner, but with her husband's permission, she would sometimes accept an invitation to dance from someone who was a little lighter on her feet. So Jim was surprised when she declined the request of Dave, the best dancer in their group. Thanks, Dave, but my dance card at Jim's is completely full tonight, she said. The conversation flowed again as everyone was enjoying a brief respite. When Dee noticed excited murmurs from nearby tables, she instinctively looked towards the entrance. Oh my God, she said loud enough for the entire table to hear. This is Marc Lavalier. Everyone in town knew who Marc Lavalier was, even the women who didn't follow football, including Linda. He was a star on the city's NFL team. Unlike some other team members, he remained in Chicago year-round. He was the kind of man who was the envy of all the other guys in the place. He was tall, handsome, well-built, had a lot of money, and, judging by the way the women at the table fawned over him, he was a real ladies' man. In addition to all this, he had a reputation as a genuinely nice guy and was as well known for his public good deeds and generosity as he was for his exploits on the field. He walked in with two other guys from the team and was immediately ushered to a table not far from their group. Of course, he immediately became the main topic of conversation. Men spoke of his remarkable exploits on the field, while women praised his generosity, good nature, and bulging muscles. After a few minutes, Dee reached out and placed her hand on Linda's arm to get her attention. Listen, she muttered excitedly as Mr. Football stood up. I think he's going to ask someone to dance. Of course, all eyes were on him as he walked across the room and approached a very pretty 30-something blonde. Jim didn't like what he saw. The woman wasn't alone, whether it was her husband or just a dating partner. He didn't know and it didn't really matter. He always considered it bad form to ask a lady to dance without first asking permission from the man she was with. Of course, he couldn't hear what was said, but Lavalier seemed to be completely ignoring her escort. His train of thought was interrupted by his wife's comment. God, for a big man, he actually moves well. You're absolutely right, Dee agreed. The men resumed their conversation again, while the women at the table kept their eyes on the dancing couple. They danced through the entire song, but the woman seemed to break down and return to her table before the second song was over. Lavalier returned to him, and Jim saw him glance in their direction before taking his seat. Luckily for Jim, the conversation at the table had moved away from Mr. Football and, as usual, focused on more fun things. Jim was about to ask Linda if she was ready for round two, when he noticed his friends on the other side of the table looking up. Before he could turn around and see what they were looking at, he heard a voice over his shoulder. I'm Mark Lavaliera. Can I invite you to this dance? He extended his hand to Linda. Dee saw the anger on Jim's face and knew he was going to say something. Jim, she whispered loud enough for him and several other people to hear. Please don't. It's just a dance. Don't ruin it for her. By that time, Linda had taken Lavalier's hand and had already gotten up from her seat anyway. Jim, accepting Dee's plea, said nothing. But his anger was obvious to everyone present. Well, that's all her, I save all my dancing for my husband. Dave grinned at Jim. Ow, he said, as Dee kicked him under the table. Paul was the next one to make fun of his friend. Don't tell me you're jealous, Jim, he said with a laugh. His response made it clear to everyone that he didn't think it was a laughing matter. I'm not jealous, I'm angry. I don't mind them dancing. What I mean is the complete disrespect I just received from him and also from my wife. This arrogant jerk completely ignored me as if I wasn't even there. It's an insult, but I think I'm more angry at Linda. She knows how I feel about it and always asks permission to dance with someone we don't know. It just shows that a wife loves and respects her husband 
and I have never refused her. This time she ignored me, just like he did. Jim, this is Mark Lavalier, Jane said, adding her two cents. I don't care who it is, he objected. You do not approach a woman, completely ignore her accompaniment, and do not invite her to dance. This is extremely impolite. He did the same when he asked the other woman to dance. Everyone at the table thought it was probably best to leave things as they were. One of the other friends decided that now would be a good time to talk about the new car he wanted to buy. Jim didn't want to ruin the evening he had planned with Linda, so he tried to forget about the incident and joined the conversation, but still kept one eye on his wife. The band was playing a slow song. Based on their earlier repertoire, Jim decided that the second song would be faster and his wife would likely join them. Unfortunately, he didn't know that Lavalier had spoken to the band and asked them to play several slow songs in a row. Jim's anger intensified when he saw his wife melt into the arms of the football star during the second dance. This is disrespect for your husband, he thought to himself. When this continued for the third time, Jim had had enough. I'm going to end this right now, he said angrily, standing up. D grabbed his hand. Jim, please. Think about how grateful she will be to you later in the evening. Please let her enjoy the moment. Yeah, come on, man, Dave and Paul said at the same time. They don't harm anyone. Here they are. We can all see them. Jim looked at his wife with a sigh and, against his better judgment, sat down again. He tried his best to join in the conversation, but he was having a hard time, and he gave a grateful sigh of relief when the group announced that they were taking a 15-minute break. He saw his wife return to the table after dancing three slow songs with Lavalliere. He watched her face as she approached. She didn't smile as everyone might have thought. Instead, she had a look of worry and guilt on her face. Jim could see that she knew what she had done was wrong and decided he wouldn't make a fuss. He really didn't want to ruin the rest of the evening. Before taking her seat, Linda told everyone at the table that she needed to freshen up and ask Dee to join her in the ladies' room. Dee could barely contain herself until the toilet door closed behind them. Well, she asked with excitement, how did it go? Were you able to feel his excitement when he danced with you? Oh, yes, Linda replied. Did he seem big? I don't think it's bigger than any other guy. I don't know. I really can't say. While Dee was thinking this over, Linda took advantage of the lull. He wants me to spend the night with him. Dee was still thinking about the size of Lavalier's household and did not fully understand what her friend had said. What? Who? Mark. Who else do you think? You? You mean he wants you to go home with him and... and spend the night with him? Exactly, Linda confirmed. Dee, I don't know what to do. I've never cheated on Jim before. But this is Mark Lavalier. I will never have this opportunity again. Did Jim say anything when we were dancing? Oh, yes, he's angry, Dee replied. First of all, he was angry that Mark ignored him when asking you to dance. He's also angry at you for not asking his permission before agreeing. Yes, I thought about it when we went to the dance floor, but by then, it was too late. Dee thought about it and was ready to offer advice. Honey... Jim's already piss it off. Any romantic plans you guys had for tonight are probably going to fall apart anyway. I'd go for it. Do you really think so? Hell, yes. As you said, how many opportunities like this do you get in a lifetime? What about Jim? I'll sort everything out with him, don't worry. I'll make him understand. Dee watched as the wheels started turning in Linda's head. Finally, she made a decision. I'm going to do it, she exclaimed. God help me, I just can't refuse. How are you going to get out of here? You know that if Jim sees you leaving, he will face you. He might even be stupid enough to try to fight Mark. Mark says he has an emergency exit from here. He gave me his number and told me to text him from the ladies' room if I decided to go. He'll meet me in the hall, and Jim will never see us leave. Then write to him, by all means. Before Jim wonders why we are taking so long and comes here looking for us. Jim was so engrossed in watching Linda and Lavalier that he didn't realize how badly he needed to go to the toilet. 
He thought about waiting for Dee and his wife to return, but he didn't know how long they'd be there, and he didn't. Saw no benefit in waiting, so he stood up and apologized. Unlike the ladies' room, which was located just off the dance floor, the men's room was in the bar area. When he returned, he saw Dee sitting next to Dave, but Linda's chair was empty. The group hadn't returned yet, so he knew she wasn't dancing. Where's Linda? Don't worry, Jim. She's fine. She just needs something to do. Jim wondered what the hell was going on. Everyone looked at him with a strange expression on their faces. The only thing he could think about was that Linda had some kind of surprise for him to make up for her previous actions. He sat down and tried to relax, but the mood at the table had changed. Everyone was quieter and more subdued. As the minutes passed, he became more and more anxious. What's going on, Dee? Where is Linda? Jim, I told you, she's fine. I'm not asking about her health, Dee. Where is she? Did she go back to the hotel? She saw that he was beginning to worry, and she was not sure that she could hide it from him for long. Please, Jim, just relax. She knew that sooner or later she would have to tell him, but she hoped it would be later, much later. She saw him take out his phone. What are you doing? I'm calling her. I want to know what's going on. When her phone went to voicemail, he called the hotel. They also had their number when he made the order. Yes, he said as soon as he answered. Number 481, please. He let the buzzer ring about 15 times before giving up. He looked at D and decided that he would make a little noise until he found his wife. He stood up abruptly and headed towards the bar. Jim, where are you going? D shouted. If you don't tell me where she is, I'll turn this place upside down until I find her, he shouted back. D stood up and ran after him. She grabbed his hand just as he was about to call the manager. Jim, she's not here. She's not at the club. Then where the hell is she, D? I'm serious, he said threateningly. You tell me what's going on, or next time I'll call the police. When she looked into his eyes, she wasn't as confident that she could work things out as she had been in the ladies' room. Jim, Linda loves you and the children with all her heart. I'm sure you know that. You guys are her whole world. She couldn't survive without you. But sometimes we all have to do things just for ourselves. Her little monologue didn't bother him at all. Where is she, D? His voice was low, determined, and downright intimidating. She spends the night with Mark. It took a second for her words to sink in. I don't understand what you mean when you say she spends the night with him. Are you saying that she left me for him? She would never... No, D cut him off. She didn't leave you for him. She'll be back tomorrow morning. Jim, she loves you more than life itself, but like I said, sometimes we just have to do some things for ourselves. It wasn't her idea. He invited her to go home with him. It will never happen again, Jim. Please let her have this night, and she will be grateful to you for the rest of her life. It's the same thing you said about dancing. He growled back. He still couldn't believe it. He had to see it for himself. A frightened D followed him as he returned to the table. He looked at his wife's empty chair, then at where Lavalier was sitting. When he saw that only two of the three chairs at this table were still occupied, he knew it was true. He looked around at those sitting at the table. Everyone avoided his gaze. He didn't think he could be any angrier, but he was wrong. He could tell by the look on their faces that they knew everything, and no one said a damn word. At that moment, the angry husband didn't care who knew what. In fact, he wanted everyone to know. He spoke loudly and clearly. You knew everything. Every damn one of you knew that my wife was going to sneak out and spend the night with that wife-stealing son of a bitch. Mark Lavalieri, and not one of you said a word to me. This idiot used his reputation, money and so-called charm to destroy my marriage, tear my family apart, and you all sat back and let it happen. We have two kids. I know a wife-stealing piece of shit like Lavalier doesn't care whose happy home he destroys as long as he's having a blast, but you were supposed to be our friends. Shh. One of his so-called friends hissed at him. Jim, keep your voice down. You don't need to broadcast it to the whole club. We are all friends, both yours and Linda's. For her, this is the chance of a lifetime, and it's one night. 
I will definitely mention this to my lawyer when I file for divorce on Monday, and also to my children when I tell them why their father no longer lives with them. Jim, please, you're not serious, are you? Dee intervened. She loves you. It's just for one night. Please give it to her and she will come back tomorrow. And she will return to an empty house, Jim announced. From now on, whenever any of you visit her and see our two children, remember that you had a hand in the destruction of their family. Just at that moment, the two guys sitting with Lavalier stood up and seemed to be heading towards him. Oh, look at this. Here come Lavalier's two thugs, he said loud enough for everyone to hear. What are you guys going to do? Take me to the parking lot and work on me. Your boss stole my wife, destroyed my family, and now you guys are going to beat the crap out of me, right? No, wait. I have an idea. Dave. Paul. Why don't you two send your wives home with these guys? They are both professional football players. They may not be Marc Lavalier, but they are on the same team. Then we can all be so happy for our wives because they spent the night with one of the celebrities, and later we can all wonder how we can resist a professional athlete while making love to our wives. We will all be able to wonder if we are still satisfying her or who she is thinking about in the throes of passion. Both of Lavalier's friends stopped in their tracks when one of the men took out his phone and pressed the speed dial button. Are you calling Mark? Ask it another. Hell, yes. I'm going to tell him to bring that bitch back here. Look around. Everyone has taken out their phonies. By morning, it will be all over the internet. His companion looked around. There must have been 30 or 40 people there, recording everything. Damn, Kevin. A lot of these phones are pointed at us. Indeed? He commented sarcastically. Damn it. What's the matter? He turned off his fucking phone. A woman sitting with her husband at another table called out to Jim. He recognized her as the woman with whom Lavalier had danced in front of his wife. That asshole tried to do the same thing to me a while ago. I told him to go to hell. Your husband is a happy man, Jim answered. He's obviously a much better judge of people than I am. He couldn't help but chuckle as he looked down and addressed the table of shocked former friends. When you see Linda, be sure to tell her that she gave up her marriage for one night with this idiot and was not even his first choice. Jim knew this would be the last time he would speak to anyone at the table, so he wanted to make sure they understood where he was. I thought you were our friends. Obviously, I was as wrong about you as I was about my wife. Next time any of you men see me, you should start looking for a way out. I won't look for you, but if we ever end up in the same room, I'll start beating you up. There was a shocked silence as Jim turned his attention to the ladies. And you bitches, I don't believe in violence against women, but if you ever try to talk to me again, I'll get loud, vulgar, cause a scene, and make sure everyone knows you pimped my wife out. This vile piece of crap. He glared at D. And for you, bitch, I could make an exception to this rule about violence against women. D took out her phone and desperately tried to dial Linda's number, but it went straight to voicemail. Around this time, Jim was approached by the club manager. Sir, I have to ask you to leave. If you refuse, I will call the police. Oh, don't worry, Jim replied. I'm leaving, but before I do, I have a question. Did you know about this? Has Lavalier done this here before? This lady says he tried to do the same thing to her. I bet my wife isn't the first, is she? Is this Lavalier's happy hunting ground for impressionable whivs? He looked at the other tables. Take this as a warning, guys. Bring your wife here and you can just leave without her, like I do. Believe me, Lavalier doesn't care about destroying your family, just like he didn't care about destroying mine. Jim walked up to the embarrassed cloakroom girl and gave her his ticket, and then left. He half expected Lavalier's two friends to follow him outside, but they didn't. He walked towards the hotel. He couldn't believe that his wife would ruin their marriage over one night. What the hell was she thinking? They talked about loyalty. In fact, the entire group he just left was talking about it. Everyone agreed. This was a topic that could not be tolerated. By the time he reached the hotel lobby, he had worked himself into an even more frantic state than before. He wanted the blood of each and everyone involved in this night. He approached the receptionist. 
I'll leave in a few minutes. Have my bill ready, he demanded. The clerk had to ask. Sir, what's the problem? The room is reserved for the whole night. Yes, there is a problem. I can't believe a hotel with a reputation to protect would support this den of infidelity. Do you know that damn dance club caters to professional athletes who seduce other people's wives all over the place? I booked a room to spend a romantic night with my wife. Now, thanks to you and the wife-stealing clientele of this establishment, I will divorce her and destroy a family with two innocent little children. I'll go up and pack my things. Have my bill ready by the time I get back. Carl Mason, the hotel's night manager, heard Jim fuming as he returned to his office. He immediately picked up the phone. Bob, what the hell happened there tonight? I have a client here who is willing to kill someone because he claims that your client seduced his wife. Yes, it was that idiot Mark Lavalier. I knew that sooner or later this would happen. This isn't the first time he sneaked out of here with someone's wife. Are you kidding me? Why didn't you ban him from the club? Because it brings clients. A lot of people know he hangs out here, so they come to check out our local football hero. However, you are right. From tonight, it will be blocked. I just hope it's not too late. I think today's incident may have already hurt business. Well, I'll tell you what. First thing tomorrow morning, I'll talk to the board and recommend that we disassociate ourselves from this. Wait, Carl. At least wait until we see how this ends. I won't wait for anything, Bob. This is bullshit. You should have stopped this a long time ago. Good luck. After hanging up the phone angrily, the manager walked up to the front desk and spoke to the clerk. Terry, let me know when you see this guy come out of the elevator. It will be done, Mr. Mason. Meanwhile, Jim returned to the room. When he opened the door, this large double bed looked very inviting. He was exhausted, emotionally and physically. He plopped down on the bed, throwing one leg up on the bed, but keeping the other on the floor. He didn't want to fall asleep just to relieve the stress for a few minutes. As he lay there, he felt grief creeping in slowly, like a tiger about to pounce. Until now, his emotions had been pure rage, with a shot of adrenaline kicking in for good measure. He sat up, lowered his other leg to the floor, and sat on the edge of the bed. Grief would have to wait, he told himself. He wasn't done with the rage yet. Not by a long shot. Jim picked up his suitcase and threw it on the bed before opening it. He took out the $300 Victoria's secret underwear he'd bought as a surprise for his wife and laid them out neatly on the bed. I found some stationery and a pen on a small table in the corner and wrote a note. To the maid, happy belated Valentine's Day. It's all yours. He took out his phone and sent this photo to his soon-to-be ex-wife with a note in the foreground. Never in his entire life had anyone hurt him as much as she did. He was ready to repay her in whatever way he could. Jim closed his suitcase and headed downstairs to pay. The clerk called his manager as soon as Jim got off the elevator. Sir, my name is Carl Mason. I am the night manager of the hotel. I couldn't help but hear you when you entered. I called the dance club and found out what happened. I offer you my most sincere apologies and will present to our board members my recommendation that we cease all ties to downbeat. Again, there is no charge for the room, and I am very sorry this happened. The manager's little speech took some of the wind out of Jim's sails. He hoped that the guy was telling him the truth about breaking ties with the club. This would at least give him a small sense of satisfaction. He had a full tank of gas, and all he wanted to do was drive until he reached the end of the earth, but he couldn't. As much as he wanted all the peace between him and his wife, he needed to think about his children. He needed to deal with his emotions. The fact is that he also needed revenge. Otherwise, he would never be able to look his children in the eyes again. On the way home, Jim thought about all the people who were recording him on their phones. It was another small victory. But he hoped they would post it on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and whatever other sites were out there. And that's when the idea came to him. As soon as Jim entered his house, he placed his suitcase on the floor and headed to his home office. He opened his laptop, clicked on Google, and started searching. It took him three tries, but he found what he was looking for. He wasn't even sure they existed, but they were there. Telephone numbers for the National Enquirer, The Globe, 
Tatler, Confidential, and a couple of other scandalous newspapers and tabloids. He clicked on the first one and saw that it was a 24-hour hotline. When he went down the page, he found that they were all the same. He took a piece of paper and jotted down what he needed to say. National Enquirer. Hotline. May I have your name, please? My name is Jim, but before I continue, I was wondering if you would be interested in the story of how Marc Lavalier stole a man's wife and destroyed his 10-year marriage. They also have two children, who now, thanks to him, will live in a single-parent family. Can you confirm this, Jim? I'm sure I can. He stole my wife. At the moment, while we are talking, she is with him. There was silence on the line for a moment before the voice answered, Jim, can you wait a couple of minutes? Please don't hang up. I'll be right back. I'll be here, Jim replied. Jim? Yes. Okay. We're interested. We'll pay $2,000 for the exclusive. What is your name? Asked Jim. Daryl. Okay, Daryl. It's agreed. I'm not interested in money. You were my first call, but I'm also going to call the Globe, Confidential, Tatler, and a few others. I'm guessing you guys have ways of finding out where these celebrities live, and I'm sure you have photographers all over the place ready to go at short notice, so whoever gets me the best photos of Lavalier and my wife together will get the exclusive. If, of course, you use the photos in conjunction with the story. Jim, it's not always so easy to get photographs. Some of these guys live in a complex with security that would rival Fort Knox. It's not my problem, Daryl. Between you and your competitors, I'm sure some enterprising paparazzi will get some nice shots. This idiot has fooled everyone with his white and fluffy image. It's time people saw him for who he really is. Fine. He heard Daryl sigh. I'll see what we can do. Where should I send photos? After giving Daryl his email address, Jim made the same call to other scandalous newspapers. Four of them said they were interested in the story and accepted his challenge for photographs. After that, he began to load the car. He took his computer and charger, a lot of clothes and shaving supplies. Having finished with the bare necessities, he looked around for more. She could have gotten the damn TV for the kid's sake, but the record player and all its albums went with it. He couldn't take his favorite chair into the car, so he reluctantly had to leave it behind. Finally, he went through the house and took the photographs of the children but left everything where she was. He took a family album from the shelf and did the same, pulling out photographs of the children from under their protective films. He quickly looked around again. When he was sure that he had taken everything he wanted, Jim took off his wedding ring and left it on the table along with a note. I hope it was worth it. P.S. I called your parents and asked them to pick up the children. Linda was still in a state of euphoria, when she opened her eyes on Saturday morning. The previous night had been everything she expected and more. She smiled and curled up in her lover's strong embrace, looking up through the skylight above the bed. For the first time in a month, it was sunny outside. There was even some crazy bird flying there. This must be an omen, she thought. Her thoughts went back to last night when the moon shone through the glass. Either way, it was a night she would remember for the rest of her life. Only after this personal confession did she think about her husband. She began to wonder what kind of reception would await her when she returned. How successful was Dee in getting things done? She was starting to feel guilty, not to mention scared. She looked into the rugged, handsome face of her lover and saw his eyes open. Well, you said you'd give me the night of my life, and you weren't kidding. Thank you. He smiled at her silently. I don't have anything today. Stay for a while. I would like to, Mark, but I need to go back to the hotel. It's still quite early, and I hope I can sneak back to the room before Jim wakes up. We haven't swam yet, he said. I don't go anywhere or do anything before swimming. Do you have an indoor pool? She didn't remember seeing anything like that when he was showing her around last night. Almost, he answered. This is an outdoor pool, but I closed it and heated it in winter. Suddenly she forgot about Jim again. But I didn't take a swimsuit with me, she said coquettishly. 
Lavalier's smile widened. We have more than a hectare of property around us. My closest neighbor is a quarter mile away and can't see the back of my house. No swimwear required, my dear. She sat down and looked out the window. It's quite far from home, Mark. I hope you don't expect me to run out there naked. It's cold out there. I have a nice warm terry robe and a pair of slippers that you can wear. A few minutes later, Linda was silently thinking, this is just completely crazy. It was only about freezing, and she had to walk hand in hand with Mark Lavalier to go skinny dipping in his indoor pool. She was wearing nothing but a robe, and he was naked as a falcon. Oh, if D could see her now. That crazy bird again, she said, trying to shield herself from the sun with her hand. What bird? I already saw her outside the window on the roof. She just keeps flying in circles. We have them everywhere here, he said, not paying attention. Once inside the pool enclosure, Mark helped her remove her robe and placed it on a chair before they both ran and jumped inside. Mark immediately started making circles. She tried to keep up, but it was impossible. So she swam to the side and was content to watch him glide through the water from one end of the pool to the other. She lost count of the number of circles, but it must have been 25 or 30 before he disappeared under the water. They had sex again in the pool. See, he said, after they had finally caught their breath again. There's nothing like a good swim to start the day. It truly was an experience that I will remember for the rest of my life, Mark, but it's really time for me to go back. Yeah, we don't want that weakling to get angry, do we? He growled with contempt. Hey, Jim may not be a football superstar, but he's no pushover, she retorted. No? Do you think he'll want to fight me for his woman's honor? The sudden sarcasm that came out of his mouth left her speechless. Yes, I thought so. He grinned, taking her silence as confirmation. This was a side of Mr. Football that she didn't see. There was real cruelty in his voice. Take me back, she said decisively. He chuckled at her obvious anger. They both got out of the pool at the same time. Lavalier grabbed the towel hanging on the back of the chair while Linda reached for her robe. Suddenly there was a loud crack and pain shot through her right buttock. She screamed and looked around as Lavalier twirled the towel in his hands. Did I tell you that I'm the champion towel catcher in our locker room? He said with an evil grin. It hurts, damn it, she cursed, rubbing her butt. She reached for her robe again when the second shot of the towel stung her on the other side of her ass. Mark, stop, it hurts, she shouted indignantly. The rage in her eyes only seemed to provoke him even more. He flicked her thigh again. If I were you, I would run away from home, he said with a laugh. I'm still wet. I'll get pneumonia if I go out there naked, she cried. He flicked her again, this time barely missing her left breast. She heard him laugh as she rushed to the door. He ran after her, maniacally grabbing a towel and yelling at her all the way into the house. She quickly tried to close the bedroom door behind her, but he was already there and pushed it through after her. His behavior completely changed. It was obvious that now that he had gotten what he wanted from her, he no longer needed her. Get dressed, he ordered her decisively. I'll drop you off at the hotel. Linda sat on the edge of the bed and reached for her panties, realizing that it was all an act. The politeness, the sophistication, the good guy image, it was all just an act. In reality, he was just a childish bully. Now she regretted letting him touch her. As she began to dress, she noticed a red welt on her thigh where he had flicked her towel. She stood up and rummaged around behind her. Of course, she had another one there. Great, she thought. Just what I needed. Marks on her body to remind Jim of what she had done. What had recently been an experience she would never forget was completely shattered in that moment. Now all she wanted to do was forget the whole damn thing and get out of here. They both got dressed in silence and headed to the front door. The night before, Lavalier didn't even want to take the time to park in the garage and left his SUV in the driveway. They had not yet reached the end of the porch when he looked up and saw half a dozen photographers standing near his area. Everyone had telephoto lenses, and they were all pointed at the two of them. He immediately grabbed Linda's hand and began to pull her back. Hey, what are you doing? She shouted. Let me go. Go back to the house, 
he growled. They're taking pictures of us. Her eyes became as big as saucers when she saw all the cameras and followed Mr. Football back. What the hell is going on? Why are they taking pictures of us? I don't know, he answered. When he pulled out his phone, he realized he hadn't turned it back on yet. He pressed the button and waited impatiently for it to load. Linda did the same with hers. As soon as he could, Lavaliere quickly dialed the number of one of his friends who was with him at the dance club. Kevin, what's going on? There are a lot of paparazzi outside my door. Even more, Kevin answered with a cynical laugh. I told you that one day you will have problems with all this, as you call it, cuckolding nonsense. This woman's husband went crazy last night. Damn, dude, you're an internet sensation. You are with her everywhere, on YouTube, Instagram, and who knows where else. Damn, I'll kill this bastard. Oh, yes, that would be very smart. Last night I was about to try to calm him down and half the people in the room pointed their phones at me. After that I had no intention of even approaching him. Hell, Chuck and I had everyone in the place staring at us while we sat at the table and waited for several minutes after the guy left before we could leave. Watch YouTube, dude, and you'll see what I mean. Okay, I'll do it now, he said, pressing the shutdown button. Meanwhile, Linda was listening to his side of the conversation. What? she asked. What's happened? He ignored her and opened the YouTube app. Linda heard Jim's angry voice. Oh my God, she exclaimed when Lavaliere showed her his phone. Your husband is an idiot. That's what happened, he yelled. She immediately dialed Dee's number. Thank God you called, Dee yelled. I've been trying to reach you since last night. Are you home? No, I'm still at Mark's house. This place is surrounded by photographers. Oh, shit. Jim went crazy last night. I tried to tell him that you still love him, but he said he was going to file for divorce. I think he is also planning to move out of the house. You must go home immediately and try to stop him. I did my best last night, but, honey, he's really angry. Okay, okay, I'm leaving right now. She hung up the phone in despair and looked at Mark. I must return home immediately, she told him. I'm not going back there with you, are you kidding me? call a taxi or Uber or something. Mark, she begged, but he turned his back to her and left. She could barely see through her tears as she googled Uber near me. She called the nearest one and was told that the car would be there in 20 minutes. She slid down the wall onto the tile floor of the foyer and cried until she heard the buzzer. She pulled her coat over her head and tried to hide her face as the cameras clicked. The Uber driver had no idea what was going on. He stared at her in the rearview mirror, wondering if he recognized her. Are you a celebrity or something like that? No, I'm not famous, I'm stupid. Please just get me there as soon as possible. She checked her phone again to see if Jim had tried to contact her. When she saw the text message, she was scared to open it, but she knew she had to. She could almost hear her heart break when she saw the laundry neatly laid out on the bed along with the note. The driver looked at her again in the rearview mirror when he heard her mournful sobs. He had no idea what she had done, but he couldn't help but feel sorry for her. After paying the Uber driver, she ran into the house calling Jim's name, but was met only by silence. For a moment she wondered if he might still be at the hotel, but that hope was dashed when she checked the closet. She collapsed on the bed, all in tears. Almost an hour passed before she stopped crying. She wiped her eyes and decided to go down to the kitchen and make some coffee to try and clear her head and think. It was at that moment that she saw his ring and note. She immediately realized that her marriage was over. She plopped down in her chair and remembered last night and how deeply she must have hurt him. Why she couldn't understand it at the time was a question she would ask herself for the rest of her life. Jim found it difficult to fall asleep but as soon as he fell asleep, he simply fell asleep. He was so emotionally drained that he slept for nine hours and didn't wake up until 10.30 on Saturday morning. The fog in his brain only began to clear when he was in the shower. As he got dressed, he considered turning on his phony, but decided that he still wasn't ready to start. Dealing with the consequences of last night, 
He needed a good breakfast, he needed coffee, he needed time to get ready. He asked the receptionist about restaurants, learned of three within walking distance, and decided on a Denny's on the next block. It was slightly past noon when he returned to his room. He took a deep breath to gather his courage and turned on the phone. There were at least a dozen missed calls from his so-called friends. He ignored them all. He saw that Linda had replied to his text message and opened it. My dear husband, I cannot even imagine how much pain I caused you last evening. Saying I'm sorry doesn't come close to the shame and regret I feel. All I can do is ask for your forgiveness and beg you, if there is even a drop of love left in your heart for me, please give me a chance to somehow make amends to you. He wrote her a reply. You're right about the pain. Never in my life have I had someone who, declaring his love for me, would so openly thrust a dagger into my heart and twist it for greater persuasiveness. I'm sure my anger will eventually pass, and I'll realize I still love you. But if we stayed together, I'd be on pins and needles waiting for the next time it would happen. I'm not going to live like this, Linda. I will meet with a lawyer as soon as possible and file for divorce. In the meantime, let's make this as fair as possible for the sake of the children. I want to come tomorrow so we can hopefully sit down together and calmly explain everything to them. After that, I will spend the rest of the day with them. Let me know if you have any problems with this. When he finished, he sat down at the small desk in the room and turned on his laptop. He had emails from all four tabloids that accepted his challenge. The first two were very similar photographs of Lavalier and his wife in front of the house. They stood quite far from each other and were wearing coats. They were depicted together, but, of course, it was impossible to say from the photographs that they had just spent the night together. He kind of assumed that the photos would be like this, but he hoped that he would at least put his arm around her shoulders. Then he checked his email from the National Enquirer. What the heck? He muttered under his breath. He clicked on other photos. Each one was just as amazing. The first few pictures showed Lavalier and his wife in bed together. Looks like they had a camera on the ceiling above the bed. The following pictures showed them walking outside to a building that looked like a Quonset military hut. She was in a white robe and he was naked. He should have stopped there because the next few pictures broke his heart all over again. It looked like two naughty teenagers were having a great time. They were both naked as she ran in front of Mr. Football while he playfully smacked a towel at her. It hit him like a ton of bricks, and it was the first time he cried. Jim had never faced anything as painful as the end of his marriage. It took him a moment to collect his thoughts again. He washed his face and made coffee using the motel coffee machine. It was almost two o'clock when he felt confident enough to call. He looked up the number on his phone and asked for Daryl, but was told he only worked part-time and only worked a few hours late at night. When he told the voice on the other end of the line who he was, he was connected to a reporter. His name was Paul. Sir, may I call you Jim? Yes, everything is fine, he answered. Jim, are you ready to tell me your story? Now? I'm just calling to let you guys know that you won. The photos you took outshone all others by an order of magnitude. Do you have hidden cameras or something like that? No. Paul answered with a slight chuckle. It just so happens that you live in the same city as our secret weapon. Secret weapon? Yes, we can't say his name, but he is the best paparazzi in this business. Not only is he a damn good photographer, but he's also an electronics genius. Last year he went out and bought a drone strictly for the camera. It has the most powerful zoom and best resolution out there, then he redesigned it. He put some kind of muffler on it. They're usually pretty noisy, but this one can fly three meters away from you and you won't hear a thing. He then equipped the camera with a polarizing filter. It reduces glare from the sun, like a pair of Polaroid sunglasses. He can park it outside someone's window and adjust the filter with his phone so that you stop seeing reflections in the glass. Everything will be clear as crystal. That's how he got those photos of your wife and Lavalier in bed together. As soon as he got the call last night, he found the address and went there to scout out the situation. It was still dark when he sent the drone up and discovered a sunroof. He thought he was above Lavalier's bed, but he couldn't see it until it got lighter. 
He also has some extra long telephoto lenses for his regular camera, so he found a place in the back where he could perch in case they tried to sneak out that way, although he didn't expect them to undress like that. There's an indoor pool in that building back there, so apparently they went skinny dipping together. This was another piece of information Jim didn't need to hear. Anyway, Paul continued, as soon as the sun rose, he saw them from above and took these pictures through the skylight. We had another guy in front, so he stayed back. He couldn't believe his luck when he saw them come out naked and head towards the pool. In addition to the pictures you saw, he got more from the drone, but the ones from ground level are better. Jim and Paul spent the next two hours talking on the phone as Jim told his story in detail and answered Paul's many questions along the way. By the time they finished, he was exhausted. After hanging up, Jim wondered if it was worth it. Will this really affect Lavalier's career? Probably not. People like this get away with whatever they want, he told himself. That's when he remembered all the people in the club with their phones off and wondered if anything had ended up on the internet. He emailed the other tabloids to tell them they had lost, then clicked on YouTube and typed Lavalier into the search bar. Holy saints, he exclaimed out loud. The entire first page was dedicated to him. He clicked on the first video and watched a replay of his pain and humiliation. With misty eyes, he began to read the comments. There were more than 300 of them. A couple were derogatory remarks aimed at him, comments like he was a weakling, but the rest destroyed Lavaliera, and to some extent Linda. He watched a few more and became increasingly inspired as he read the comments from each of them. Hell, he thought, maybe I didn't even need the tabloid story. His thoughts were interrupted by the buzzing of his phone with a text message. It was from his former friend Dave. He didn't intend to open it, but curiosity got the better of him. Jim, D just got off the phone with Linda. She says you've gone crazy. Please don't do this. It was just one night. You shouldn't leave a 10-year marriage because of this. Please reconsider. Jim returned the message. Last night I told you, don't call, don't write, don't contact me in any way. None of you warned me when you knew what Linda was going to do. Not even you, my so-called buddy. If I could have gotten to her before she left, I most likely could have stopped her and possibly saved my marriage. Of course, we'll never know now, will we? Don't contact me anymore. I will never receive calls or texts from you, D, or anyone else who sat at this table last night. To me, you can all go to hell. Another wave of sadness washed over him as he pressed the send button. More tears escaped the corners of his eyes as he thought about the loss of his wife his marriage, and to some extent, his children. He thought about staying married for the sake of his children. But it was no use. He will never be able to show the love and affection for Linda as he once did. And it will not be good for the children to grow up in an environment devoid of love either. It wasn't an easy decision, but he made the only one he could make. Linda was ready to receive him on Sunday morning. When he approached the door, she had already taken a shower, dressed beautifully, and put on makeup. He accepted her invitation for coffee and followed her into the kitchen. Where are the children? I asked. Outside, playing in the backyard. He nodded in agreement and sat down at the table. He knew she wanted to talk and he wasn't going to deprive her of that. In fact, he hoped that she would find a way to persuade him to stay, even though he knew that this would not happen. Jim... I'm very, very sorry for what I did. I can't imagine how you felt when you found out I left. I honestly don't know what I was thinking. I agree, he replied. No one could imagine how I felt if this had not happened to him. I don't know what came over me. I've never been with anyone this famous before. It made me feel so special. Then when he asked me to go home with him, I, I don't know, I was just so amazed. I didn't even think about anything like that, but she started crying and found it difficult to continue. I'm so sorry, Jim. I kept telling myself that it would only be one night, a night that will never happen again, she cried. Everyone keeps telling me it's just one night. Let me tell you how I feel. Okay, she agreed. She was angry at herself for breaking down. She was desperate to save her marriage and wanted to throw herself on her knees and beg if that was what it took. 
but maybe it was better to know what he was thinking first. You know, he began, when I found out that you left last night, everyone at the table said, it's just one night. Give her this one night, you can't divorce her. Because of one night, you're only that she said it again. But the whole point was that it was just one night. He saw that she didn't understand. If you came to me and told me that I fell in love with another man and that you were leaving me to spend the rest of your life with him, I would understand. I obviously wouldn't like it, but I would understand it. I've seen it happen. Two people get too close at work and fall in love, it happens. If you had told me that you were out with the girls one night, got drunk and ended up in bed with some womanizer, I would have understood that too. Again, I'm damn sure I wouldn't like it, but it happens. None of us are perfect. If you were in sales and traveled a lot, were alone on a long trip and desperately needed company one night, I would understand. But this is where all this does not apply. You barely met him, so I know you weren't in love, you only had a few drinks, so you weren't drunk, and I was there, so you sure as hell weren't lonely. Damn, we had a wonderful romantic evening planned, and you threw it all away for one night, he said, emphasizing the last two words, drawing them out. You can't imagine how worthless I felt, knowing that my wife cared so little about me that she deliberately drove a stake through my heart for one night of sex with another man. I didn't care who he was. Do you understand what I'm getting at? The fact that it was just one night makes it not better, but a thousand times worse. You threw it all away. Our marriage, our family life, our future, our children's future. For one night. You knew how I would feel. You knew how devastated I would be. And yet you completely ignored my feelings for one fucking night with this guy. He became emotional and didn't want his children to see him like that. He calmed down and lowered the volume. Understand? Do you see what you've done? You didn't leave me for a lifetime of happiness with someone else. You left me for one night of sex with another man. Linda wiped a wave of tears from her eyes. She really understood. Until now, she had thought about it like everyone else, that it was just one night that he would not give up the marriage because of one night, but now she realized that it was she who abandoned him for one night, not him. He was right, absolutely right, and there was no point in even trying to fight him about it. There were no counter-arguments she could discuss, nothing she could say. Their marriage was over. She had to accept it. She asked for a few minutes to compose herself before talking to the children. When she was ready, they called the children. They, of course, attacked their father with questions about where he was. Linda was instrumental in helping explain that Dad was looking to get a second home. Only the thought of spending the day with their father kept them from crying, but they made up for it that evening when he dropped them off. Never in her entire life had Linda felt so depressed as when she heard her children crying in their beds, knowing that she was the cause. True to his word, Jim filed for divorce the following week. Linda, knowing that her imminent dismissal would be very fair, used the services of the same lawyer. It was decided that she would stay in the house for the sake of the children, so Jim rented a three-bedroom apartment just four miles away, where the children spent almost half of their time. As for the consequences... Everything turned out better than Jim could have ever hoped. In an attempt to stop the loss of customers due to all the YouTube videos from that night, owner Downbeat posted his own video on the same hosting site, saying that the establishment was under new management. Without naming any names, he also informed the public about the new policy regarding some former clients. Jim understood this to mean that Lavalier was no longer welcome there. The shit really hit the fans when the new edition of the National Enquirer hit the stands. Jim and Linda were both grateful that the children were too young to be affected by the story. Luckily, they obscured Linda's face, but the photo of her and Lavalier in bed, with his arm around her, made the front page, along with other nude images of them, censored inside. A month after the original story hit grocery store checkout shelves, the National Enquirer offered Linda $5,000 for her story. Although Linda didn't believe she should be rewarded for what she did, she took the money and put it into a fund to fund college for Emma and Tommy. 
In the article, she deeply apologized to her husband and admitted that the entire episode was the stupidest thing she had ever done. She did not throw a single blow, exposing Lavalier's cruelty and bullying. When Jim read her story about how that idiot hit her with a towel hard enough to cause welts, he remembered how wrong he was in thinking she was having a good time. This was the first time since this all started that he had sympathized with his soon-to-be ex-wife. Lavalier was no longer the Prince of Chicago. He was despised almost everywhere he went. Even the other players avoided him when practice began later that year, and for the first time in his life, Lavalier was booed from the stands when he took the field during games. Two years after that night at Downbeat, he was traded to a smaller team. Linda waited a year to start dating, but felt that finding a new man to share her life with was probably hopeless. Based on her ten-year history with Jim, her expectations were too high. Eventually, she gave up the search and decided to dedicate her life to simply raising two wonderful children. Jim was a little luckier. After two disastrous short-lived relationships, he found a woman with some potential, but he was in no hurry. Let it happen if it happened. In the meantime, he and Linda got along well, and the children adapted to their new living conditions. They even still continue to do things as a family from time to time. Life goes on. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.